Yeah, take your Bible this evening, and uh, I'll tell you what, go to the book of Genesis, would you please? You know the verse at the top of your paper is Matthew 5, 48. That's where Jesus said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 6, so open up to there if you would. Genesis chapter 6, and it uh, should be easy to find, that's the first book in the Bible. Okay, Genesis chapter 6. And let's pray, shall we? Father, we pray your blessing now in our study together tonight. Please give me your help, Lord, as we go through this lesson this evening. Lord, give me clarity of mind. Uh, give me clarity as I try to communicate the truth. Lord, give all of us understanding, and Holy Spirit, be the teacher that we need you to be tonight. Open our eyes that we could build wondrous things out of your law tonight. And I'll thank you for it, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, be ye therefore perfect. What did Jesus mean when he said that? I mean, uh, uh, how many times have you caught yourself when you're, uh, you, you, you do something wrong or you do something stupid or you do something and somebody is always glad to point it out to you and you've said, well, I'm not perfect. Okay? And uh, like that's a revelation to somebody, you know. But uh, we always kind of back off and say, I'm not perfect. Well... What did the Bible mean? Let's look at some scriptures. You're going to get your Bible. You're going to use it here in the beginning especially and look at these scriptures. All right, start in Genesis 6. Notice verse number 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. So the Bible says Noah was perfect. Hmm. What about Genesis 17? Did I list those on your... Outline, good. I wanted you to have these. As you can see, here it's Abram. And when Abram, verse 1, was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Hmm. So God told Abraham to walk before him and be imperfect. Uh, you don't have to turn, but you know, most of you know Job 1. God said Job was a perfect man. Uh, he said that in Job 1, verse 1, Job 1, verse 8, and again in chapter 2 and verse number 3. Three different times he's reminding Satan that Job was a perfect man. Go to the New Testament with me and look at Luke chapter 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 6. Jesus speaking, and Jesus here is talking about a disciple, a follower of his, a learner, if you will. And he says, verse number 40, The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Jesus prayed in John 17. John 17, which is the true Lord's Prayer. I think it's a prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden as he went a little further and prayed that night. And he's praying in John 17. Notice verse number 23, what Jesus says. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved me, and loved them as thou hast loved me, that they may be made perfect in one. Paul, as he writes to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Would you look there, please? 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Notice, as he writes to farewell here, verse 11, he says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be what? Perfect. Be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Be perfect. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 13. Ephesians 4 and verse number 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Philippians chapter 3, Galatians, Ephesians, the next book is Philippians chapter 3. Notice with me verse number 15. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Most of us are familiar uh, 
Well, let's look at Colossians 1 and verse 28. Then we'll go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. All right? Colossians 1 and verse 28. Notice what Paul says. We'll be in Colossians in Sunday school on Sunday. But he says, Whom we preach, preaching Christ, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Then look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Most of us are familiar with verse 16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so, over and over again, and we'll look at, another, we'll look at one in James a little bit later, we'll go to James, but God, God over and over again says we're to be perfect. What? does he mean what does it mean perfect now let's let's look at let me tell you some things that it doesn't mean first okay uh, maybe that will help if we know what it isn't okay uh, being what what Christian perfection is not it is not perfect knowledge it is not perfect knowledge in other words as long as we're human there's going to be a lack of perfect knowledge nobody like I said when you get to heaven and you see a chair that sits underneath a sign on the wall that says, had 100% of everything right, no one will sit in that chair. Okay? Now, Brother Woods may sit next to that chair, but not in that chair, okay? But uh, nobody, we, we all fall short. None of us are going to have that perfect knowledge. Nobody has, nobody has the complete knowledge of the ways of God. The Bible says his ways are past finding out. Uh, it's unsearchable. We'll never understand all the ways of God. There are some things, the secret things belong to God. And there's times somebody's going to say, why did God do this? I don't know why God did that. We don't have that perfect knowledge yet to know why he did that. And so whether it comes to any of the understanding certain scripture or whatever, uh, it, it doesn't. So it doesn't mean that we have perfect knowledge, but that doesn't break the command we have to be perfect. Okay? Number two, or B there, it is not freedom from mistakes. As long as we not only lack perfect knowledge, we have to understand we could be mistaken regarding facts. We can be mistaken sometimes in judgment. We can... Uh, the most mature Christian can do things that they later regret having done. We can all say things we were later regret having said. And so, it's not freedom from mistakes. See, it's not freedom from infirmities. Infirmities. I'm not talking about sicknesses necessarily, but um, it, it, it doesn't mean we don't ever fall asleep reading the Bible. It doesn't mean that your mind never wonders when someone's praying. All right, you're 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 gonna be you're gonna handle those uh, infirmities still. Not uh, th those things are not necessarily sinful, but they are weaknesses, and you're gonna have to live with those. So it's not it's not free from. I mean, it's not perfect knowledge. It's not freedom from mistakes. It's not freedom from infirmities. It's not freedom from temptations. We know that Jesus was perfect, and yet He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So it's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to give in to temptation. And so it doesn't mean if you're perfect, you don't have any temptation. It doesn't mean E, absolute perfection. Because only God can be absolutely perfect. He has perfect knowledge. God has no weaknesses or infirmities. God can never make a mistake. He never, he, and, and, and so God, only God can possess that. Now, here's, here's our problem when we look at the Bible and we read the word perfect, okay? The modern definition of perfect. When I say, give me a definition of perfect, you know what most people think of? Without yeah, without a flaw, right? Uh, there's no mistakes. I mean, it's just, it's just 
perfect, no imperfections, entirely without fault or defect, flawless, like a perfect diamond, no flaws. It, it is, if something is, uh, f- is, is well written, Cindy, no mistakes in it, you say it's letter perfect, see, no flaws, no defects, everything is the way it's supposed to be. Now, that's the difficulty. That is not the definition the Bible gives for perfect. Okay? The Bible definition of perfect simply means this. It means finished, complete, fully equipped, and informed. Finished, complete, fully equipped, and informed. So when it says Noah was perfect, what does it mean? Noah was complete. Noah was finished. Noah Noah was fully equipped and informed in his generation. Understand? When it says Abraham to be perfect, walking before God, Abraham was fully equipped and informed to walk before God. 2 Timothy 3.16, when we have all the Scripture, give him inspiration, so the man of God can be, all right, completely, fully informed and instructed. See? Furnished to all good works. And so we understand that's the definition of perfect by Bible terminology. Now, when the Bible talks about us being perfect, there's two areas to perfect. All right? Number one, the Bible says we're to have a perfect walk. Now that has to do with our heart. Look in the scripture to 1 Kings chapter 8, will you please? 1 Kings chapter 8. We're to have a perfect walk or a perfect heart. And you'll see that as we look here in 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings 8 is the dedication of Solomon's temple. Solomon here is talking to the people. And in verse 61, notice what he says. Let your heart, therefore, be perfect with the Lord our God. When your heart is is, uh, fully equipped and informed, all right, when your heart is complete, then notice what, what will happen. You'll walk in His statutes. You'll keep His commandments as at this day. Your heart, to be perfect, then desires to be obedient. You see, your heart has to do with how you live. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7, I believe. Guard your heart with our diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. It's how we live. Look at 1 Kings chapter 11, just over a couple pages. 1 Kings 11 and verse 4. Notice what happened here. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. When his heart was not perfect, when his heart was not complete, when his heart was not fully equipped and informed, you know what he did? He went into idol worship. He did not obey God. He did not have a perfect walk. And there's other scriptures there listed, I think, uh, for you to look at. Our heart. Now, the heart, look here a minute, the heart is not always easy to define in the Bible. Because sometimes we, the heart is, is associated with our emotions. When you, uh, when you love something, you, you, you do that heart thing. Because your heart has to do with your emotions. And it does. But yet, our heart also has to do with how we think because the Bible says as a man thinketh in his heart. And David, you know, we read some scriptures here a while back where they thought in his heart. The thoughts and intents of our heart. And so it's associated with our mind that, that we think. And, and, and it is. So our, our, our emotions and our, uh, what we think and, and how we feel and, and, and we, we, it also is with our will. Somebody can do something, but if they're not doing it very well or they're doing it with a sigh and with an attitude, we think, well, they're doing it, but their 
heart isn't in it. Okay? And so it has to do with our will as well. So it's associated with all of our mind, our will, and our emotions. That's our heart. But here, he's, he's saying, I want my heart to be complete. I want my heart to be fully equipped. My mind, my will, and my will, I want all that to be complete to, to worship and to serve God only. A perfect heart is a responsive heart. It, it will answer to when God speaks to your heart. And God always, we know this, man looks on the outward appearance, where does God look? God's looking on our heart. God's concerned about our heart. Now, let's talk about an obedient heart. When our heart's perfect with the Lord, then we walk in His statutes, we keep His commandments, we do not go after idols. We don't chase things that would come between us and God. That's what Solomon did when his wives turned his heart to idols. So his heart would not be perfect with the Lord his God. So God is in the process of perfecting our hearts. Giving us, we talk about someone as a heart for God. Okay, That's a process that takes place. As God begins to give us what we need, in our heart, our mind, our will, our emotion. Uh, completely equipping our heart, furnishing our heart with everything we need to worship and serve Him with our life. And, and that's what God wants. He doesn't want just our lips. He wants our heart. He said, there are people that draw nigh to me with their lips, but their what? Heart is far from me. God's not interested in that. God's not interested in just outward service. He's interested in your heart. Your mind, your will, your total being. The first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. So he's always looking at the heart and, and he says, I want it to be an obedient heart. It means that whenever, you, whenever the Spirit of God prompts you something or, 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 or pricks your heart about something, you respond to that. The more, it, when, you, when you refuse it, the less sensitive you become to that. And so always be responsive. That's an obedient heart. How's your heart? Is it obedient? Does it want to do what God desires to do? God wants that to perfect your heart. Then, so it's an obedient heart, but also it's an examined heart. It's an examined heart. David said in Psalm 139 and verse 23 and 24, would you look there? Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Notice what David writes. David says, Search me, O God, and know what? My heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. He said, God, I want you to search my heart. Jeremiah said, uh, in Jeremiah, the Lord said, I, the Lord, search the hearts. The word search there means I penetrate. I examine deeply. Now, God looking at my heart is a whole lot different than me looking at my heart. Because the heart is deceitful above all things. If that's wicked, who can know it? How many, how many times have, have you heard us say, people? the world's philosophy is follow your heart. Don't do that. You're going to be in trouble if you do. Because it'll deceive you into, into things that you don't want to do. And, and by the way, don't you just examine it because you want God to examine it. God penetrates. God, God gets, gets deeper. It's, it's, the, it's exactly the difference, mom and dad, when your child says their room is clean and you go in and say whether their room is clean. You look a bit deeper than they look, don't you? Hmm? You'll look under the bed. You'll open the closet door and let everything fall out. You know? uh, you're, 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 you're looking a little deeper than they look when they say it's good. It's all, all, it's all taken care of. God looks deeper, and He knows our heart. We can't know our own heart, but God does. You want the, uh, the, the, the perfect heart. When God is perfecting your heart, 
then you desire Him to examine your heart. And you want Him to shine in all the hidden parts. Dig out, expose anything that is not Christ-like. I want to be, I want to be right with God. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Some of you know it by heart. But if you want to look at it, Hebrews 4 and verse 12, where the Bible says, you know, the Word of God is quick. Well, the word quick means what? It's alive. It's quick. It's alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even and dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. And now notice, it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It, it, the Word of God exposes your heart. It'll, it'll let you know what's going on in your heart. Why is it that a lot of people have a hard time? Listen, why, why, some, why unsafe folks have a hard time coming to church? Because it exposes the thoughts and intents of their heart. That's uncomfortable. How many times, how many times you've been in a service and you kind of got upset because you felt like the pastor was preaching to you? Or you feel like somebody told him something about you? I can't tell you the times people walk out and a wife or a husband will say, she's been talking to you this week or he's been talking to you. No. But the thoughts and intents of your heart, that's the Word of God. You see? And, and that, listen, don't be uncomfortable with that. Welcome that. And say, that's because God wants to perfect my heart. And I want Him to do that. I, I want it to be an examined heart. I, want, I desire an obedient walk, an obedient heart, and I want to allow God to search my heart. And then C, I want a trusting heart. A trusting heart. The passage there in Psalm 22, the psalmist said this, Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. A trusting heart. The word there, trust, in, in, in the, the Bible language there that was written in, in Hebrew, you know what it means? It literally means to fling oneself off a cliff. That's the trust you have. Like, like when you used to set the little kid you know, on, on, the, on, on a counter, or, and you say, come on, jump, jump. Huh? And they would just, hesitantly at first, but then they'd jump and you'd catch them and then, you put them up there again, and here they come. And pretty soon, when you, as soon as you set them down there, you better be ready because they're, they're flinging themselves at you. They've learned to trust. They've learned to trust you. Now that's an aspect of trust for sure. But that's not the only aspect of trust. Trust is more than just submissive acceptance that God will take care of me. It's active belief. Listen. Most people look at trust or faith in God. They look at God as a kind of a fire and rescue guy. In other words, Satan sets my house on fire. I'm stranded on the roof and I'm yelling, help me, help me, save me. And of course, God sends the angels and they put out a big net and I jump off the roof and, and God delivers me. And then we praise God. Thank you, Lord, for getting me out. Thank you, Lord, for sparing my life. And... and we, we kind of limit God to rescue operations. Satan gets me into messes, or I get myself into messes. God, rescue me. God, help me. God, come deliver me. And by the way, He does. And He has done that. But, but that's a very limited view of trust and a very limited view of faith. You see, think about this. When that's what we think... We're, we're limiting God to always being the reactor to what the devil has done or what we have done. And God's reacting to those situations to come help us. God's not, God's not the reactor. God is always the one. God is the initiator. God is always in control. God is always the one. He's... 
our steps, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. God knows exactly what you're going to do. The, the things that we, we are set to do, He already knows ahead of time. The devil, has no, the devil has no access to you or me as a believer except that God allows him to have access to us. We learned that from Job. He couldn't touch Job without God saying, okay. God isn't going to touch you or me, or the Satan isn't going to touch you or me without God saying, okay. And so everything is guided and directed by God. And, and, and we... What kind, of, what kind of father, what kind of parent would you be if you allowed a child molester or a drug pusher or some uh, to, to have access to your child? You say, I would never do that. You think God's going to just allow someone to have access to you? What kind of father is he? Where is he? Don't be, be careful about being so quick to say the devil did this to me. Be careful about so quick giving the devil credit or the devil put this on me or the devil did this. Let me ask you a question. Then where was your father? Was he sleeping? No, the Bible reminds us he who watches over us never slumbers and never sleeps. Hmm? Doesn't he care about you? God had to lower the hedge around Job for Satan to get at him. It's no different for you or me. Remember, even when Jesus, after, when, after he was baptized, the Bible says he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. Wow. So he was tempted of Satan in the will of God. He was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan. Wow. You know why? Because God's always in control. Not Satan. God's not the reactor. He's the initiator. You see, a trusting heart says, all my steps are ordered by the Lord. He is my loving Heavenly Father. Oh, he permits suffering, temptation, and trials. But He always makes a way to escape that I may be able to bear it. He has an eternal plan, an eternal purpose. He numbers the hairs on my head. He formed my body. He knew me when I was in my mother's womb. He knows when I sit down. He knows when I stand up. He knows my, my, uh, uh, everything that I do. I'm the apple of His eye. He's the Lord. And He's not just Lord of my life. He's Lord of every situation in my life. And so, that's a trusting heart. And that's what God desires, as He desires to perfect our walk with Him. Now, that's a... That's a to, to become fully informed, to become fully equipped, isn't a, you know, snap your finger and it's done. It's a process that takes place. That's why, that's why the Bible says he gave pastors and teachers and evangelists to the church for the perfecting of the saints. See? For the equipping. For the fully informing the saints so your heart can become perfect with God. And that affects my walk. So walk thou before the Lord Abraham and be perfect. That's what God said. So our walk has to be perfect, but then God didn't stop there. That would have been good if He would have, but He didn't. Because the second thing that has to be perfected, or perfect in us, is our talk. Go to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Are you okay? Everybody all right? All right. James chapter 3. James 3, verse 1, he says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. So, James begins the chapter here giving us a warning. 
And he says, be not many masters. A master was a teacher. And basically he's saying, let not many of you be teachers. Teacher here, someone who explains the Word of God. Someone who teaches God's Word. God says, uh, be careful about that role. doesn't say that, that no one should teach. It says, don't rush into that position. Much like, much like the office of the bishop in 1 Timothy 3, where the Bible says it's not to be a novice, not to be somebody who's new in the faith, because he'll fall into a snare and a condemnation of the devil, and uh, he'll have problems. He gets lifted up with, a novice will be lifted up with pride, Timothy says. And, and he'll fall into the condemnation of the devil. It says, you know, in a multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, Proverbs says. So, I, it, it tells us something, doesn't it? The more that I talk, the more opportunity I have to sin. Say something I shouldn't say. And so... Don't be in a hurry to be a teacher. Don't be in a hurry to talk. It says the, the truth is we all ought to learn to be uh, learners first and teachers second. The Bible says let everyone be swift to hear, slow to speak. Most of us have that reversed. We're swift to speak and slow to hear. In fact, most of the time when we're hearing, we're thinking about what we're going to say, not what the people, not what the person is saying to us. Amen. Now here's an amazing statement. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. When you bridle the tongue, God says, when you learn to, to master the tongue, you become a complete, fully equipped, and informed Christian. That's a big statement. Now don't feel defeated if you struggle with the tongue. Many people in the Bible did too. Job was a righteous man. In fact, God said he was perfect. But you know what Job said? I am vile to God. He said, what shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Well, that's a good thing to do sometimes, isn't it? Isaiah said, I'm a, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Woe is me. Peter loved the Lord, no doubt about it, but around that fire, outside of Pilate's judgment hall, he cursed and swore and denied that he even knew the Lord. The tongue is a powerful thing. And it determines, listen, it determines the control of the rest of your body. That's what God said. And he gives a couple of illustrations here. Notice what he gives. In verse 3, it's bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us when we turn about their whole body. You put that bit in the horse's mouth, just a small little round metal piece, and you can change the direction of the whole entire horse. By the way, just with a slight tug, that whole horse will obey you. The bit infects the entire body, not just the mouth. Then he says, there's a ship, which so they be great and driven to fierce winds, they're turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Large vessels can be moved by that small piece of wood, a rudder. Big, strong, powerful ships moved by a small piece of wood. It's an amazing thing. It shows, these illustrations show us that small, almost insignificant things 
can change the course or the direction of much larger things. Now we know from the Lord Jesus that what comes out of our mouth proceeds from our heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When he talks about evil thoughts or murders and adulteries and immoralities and false witnesses and theft and gossip and all those things, it's all cataloged in, in, in I think, the Gospel of Mark and also in Matthew. It's all what comes out of the man that defiles him because all that comes from our heart. Principle number two, I think, in Reformers Unanimous is that all sin has its origin in our heart. Before, and by the way, that's why, don't ever get too judgmental on someone over a sin they commit because that same sin is in your heart. We're all capable of any of those sins that's listed there. Don't ever get to thinking that that, I would never do anything like that. You could do something like that because it's in your heart too. Okay? It's all in there. All sin has its origin in the heart. And that's what defiles the person. The mouth reveals what we are. In any given moment, what we say gives us a snapshot of what we really are. Jesus said, that a good person out of the good treasure of his heart will bring forth good fruit. The evil person out of the evil treasure of his heart will bring forth corrupt fruit. He said out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. We've all been in situations when you haven't had time to think or someone hasn't had time to calculate what they're going to say. Something has happened. Some, someone surprised them or they've... Uh, someone's hit them or they've hit themselves with something and something flies out of their mouth. And they may say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh! One of, the, one of the dumbest things you ever say is, I don't know where that came from. Yeah, you do. Where did it come from? Came from in here. What's down in the well comes up in the bucket. And that's why you guard your heart. And that obedient heart we talked about earlier, that examined heart, that trusting heart that gives you an obedient walk, that perfect walk, will reveal itself in how you talk. We reveal what we are through what we say. When our walk is perfected, it shows in our speech. Remember Peter, when they accused him at the fire? The little maid said, your speech berayeth you. Literally means it, it betrays you. In other words, she could tell just by the way he talked that he was a follower of Jesus. You ever, you ever catch yourself in a, in a, in not in a church setting, but just somewhere else, and you catch yourself saying amen to something? Or sometimes I've got to be careful. I'll call somebody brother, and I don't know if he's saved or not, but I've called him a brother. You ever catch yourself doing that? You know? I, it's just, that's just how I talk. It's just, just and, and you ought to have things like that. And you ought to, it, it, it shows what's in your heart. Now, let's look at uh, one last verse and then we'll, we'll finish up. Ephesians chapter 4. Would you look at Ephesians 4? You know the verse, but look at it with me. The Bible says, verse 32, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ hath forgiven you. I want to look at verse 29. I'm sorry. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed where? Out of your mouth. Now, if I, if I don't want any corrupt communication coming out of my mouth, I've got to keep the corrupt communication from going into my heart. Okay? So, see, that's why, that's why 
you don't watch things that have cursing and swearing and corrupt communication because what goes in here and goes in here goes down in here. That's where those words come from when you're not thinking and you're reacting to something. Those words came from you hearing or seeing things and it came down into your heart. And then it'll come out. So he says, don't let any corrupt communication breathe out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. What's edifying mean? Yeah, build somebody up, building up. What? That it may minister grace unto the hearers. What's grace? Undeserved favor, isn't it? God is gracious to us. He gives us favor that we didn't deserve. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We don't deserve that. God gave us grace. Now, so what's he saying? When we speak to others, we're to build up and we're to give them grace. Well, I would have told them a good job, but I don't think they deserve to hear that. Well, why don't you give them grace? Well, I would have told them that, but I think they were expecting to hear that. Well, then give them grace. Give them what they don't deserve. Give them, give them something that will build them up anyway. That's our responsibility. Do you minister grace to people who hear you talk? Does it build them up? Here's what you do before you say something. You always ask yourself these, these questions. Number one, is it true? And by the way, just because it's true doesn't mean you have to say it. If it's, go, if it's not going to edify, if it's not going to minister grace, I don't have to say it even though it's true. Because the second thing you ask is, is it kind? Is this kind? If it, it doesn't matter if it is true, if it's not kind, why would I say it? Number three, you ask yourself, is it necessary to say this? Number four, will it strengthen someone? Will it build somebody up? Or is it going to tear somebody down? Is this going to, by me saying something about this person, is that going to build them up in their eyes or is that going to tear them down in their eyes? And then, number five, am I speaking the truth in love? The Bible says we speak the truth in love. When we, when God helps you to get control of the tongue, He's perfecting you. You're allowing God to, to, to perfect, to complete you, to be a fully equipped and informed Christian. I want my walk to be perfect, but I want my talk to be perfect. And so God has to perfect both my heart and my tongue. What manner of persons ought we to be? We ought to be perfect. We ought to be perfect before the Lord. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. And Lord, I pray that we would remember the admonition of Philippians 1 that you would have begun a good work in us, we'll perform it until the day of Christ. Lord, I pray that as Paul told the church at Colossae that he's warning every man and teaching every man that he may present every man perfect that each of us would look at our life and say, Lord, perfect in me my walk and my talk. That I may walk before you perfect in my generation, like Noah did, like Abraham did, like Job did. Lord, I pray that you would allow you to bring us to perfection. 
complete us, fully equip and inform us that we might be vessels of honor for you. Thank you for people who love you. Thank you for people who love the Bible. Now, Lord, help us to leave this place tonight to be doers of the word and not hearers only. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing our song, The Joy of the Lord is My Strength. In choir, you'll come right on up, all right? You got it? There we go. That's how you sing it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. God bless you. You are dismissed.